We entrust this evening to you. Consume us, our mind, body, and soul, and draw us to a disposition of receptivity. The voice of Jesus. Amen. So that in receiving his voice, we will we may respond with joy, the joy of the gospel, and share that gift that we have received with our brothers and sisters in our community and our walk toward eternity. We ask for the grace to be holy docile, to surrender to your plan for each one of us. Now walk toward becoming the, the saints that God our Father desires for us to be. We ask this prayer of the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Just a few announcements uh, before our presenter Jeff Cavan speaks to us this evening. In September of this year, Jeff and Emily and myself, we're going to be leading a pilgrimage to Holy. And so we're going to go and we're going to visit some of these amazing sites where St. John Paul the Great and St. Peter Stein, St. Faustina, St. Maximilian Colby, and Blessed Jersey Populisti spent much of their time in their formation, their walk toward eternity. So we want to invite you to go to www.jeffgames.com to find out more information about that upcoming pilgrimage in September. It's going to be amazing, and we would love for you to walk with us during that time. Also, during the Lenten season on Monday nights at 6.30 p.m., we're going to be hosting the Bible Timeline Study that Jeff Cavins has put together. Uh, email of Wendy to sign up for this. This is a great follow-up to the parish mission on becoming the disciples that our Lord Jesus Christ desires for us to be in our walk toward eternity. So, without further ado, let us welcome our presenter for our new mission, Mr. Jeff Gates. Uh, 
be chased with the chase. And we got some pictures. She's an amazing lady, an amazing lady. And so uh, that was a real, a real blessing for us to be able to, to do that. So I just wanted to let you know we had some good fried chicken, some greens. And am I saying that right? And some wonderful food down there. Well, last night, I'm going to pray tomorrow, but last night I wanted to just kind of give you an update of what we did, especially if you weren't here last night. Uh, this is the Activated Disciple Mission, and we're talking about becoming activated disciples. We're talking about going from being fans of Jesus to being followers of Jesus, from believing the right things to living the right way. And we're talking about, about going from the page to the pavement. We're talking about putting this in practice and having a, a shape to our day that reflects the fact that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have a, a mission that we're joining with Him. And that Jesus didn't come to earth 2,000 years ago and die for us just simply to get us to agree with His theology and His worldview. But He died for us so that we could be renewed, made new, and that we would become like Him and join with Him in His mission. And one of the hardest parts about that mission, to be honest with you, is what do you do with your suffering? What do you do with your suffering? What do you do when you have physical suffering? What do you do when people talk about you or they gossip about you? But what do you do if you have moral suffering? That's the suffering in the heart. You lose a child. You lose a spouse. Uh, you have a struggle with depression or anxiety, or you have uh, lost your job, and you're wondering, what am I going to do? And you go through that suffering, what do you do? And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow night. We're going to talk about the disciple and suffering. Suffering in the life of a disciple. And I have some good news for you, and that is this, that suffering has value if you know what to do with it. And suffering can put a smile on your face and joy in your heart right when you thought that everything was over and life would never be the same. And I know that not from theological studies alone, but I know that from the suffering that I have experienced in my life. And I'm going to share a little bit of that tomorrow night. But tonight we're going to go into a specific aspect of being a disciple of Jesus. We covered a lot of things last night, but tonight we're going to take a look at the proclamation. Of the gospel. And we're going to take a look at how we share Jesus with other people in your way, according to a structure that has been given to us by the church and in the New Testament. And it is a message that works and it is powerful. And God has given that message to us as a church. So let's pray and once again, let's be open to what the Lord is saying to us. And if I'm telling you at the beginning of the talk that I'm going to convince you to start sharing Christ wherever you go, and when I say that, you're thinking, uh-uh, no way, uh -uh, that is not my gift, then I want you to be open right now, say, open, you know, open your heart up and say, Lord, I, I'm open to being changed, I'm open to becoming a new person, and I'm open to doing things that you said I could possibly be afraid of. Because the number one thing Jesus said was, don't be afraid. Have you had anything to ask me this before I pray? Have you had anything in the last five years in your parish, by parish meaning your church, in your church in the last five years, have you had anything that you faced where you looked over at your spouse or a friend and said, hey, I, I'm afraid. I can't do that. I'm afraid. They're calling on me to do this. That's out of my wheelhouse. I don't know. Most people have never experienced a fear when it comes to the gospel until they're called upon to act like Jesus or to proclaim something to somebody else in love. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What I'm talking about tonight and last night is I believe, as I said, is one of the major messages that we need to hear today. And what I'm going to talk about today, tonight, is sharing Christ with others, which I believe is one of the chief reasons why we don't grow as Catholic churches. We don't grow because we don't share the good news with others. But in your mind, you have this idea of what sharing Christ is and standing on the corner of the street and telling people you're going to hell unless you repent. And that's what I'm saying. I want you all to do that this week. <laughs> Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we love you and we adore you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us life and life eternal. We thank you for saving us and continuing to save us daily. And hopefully, Lord, we will, we will experience this salvation all the way to the end of our last breath on earth. Lord, we acknowledge that you have called us to more than just being saved. You have called us to mission. You've called us to relationship. You've called us to change, become like you. And we know, Lord, that it doesn't happen with a book, and it doesn't happen with a tape or a CD or a television show, but it happens as a result of following you and trusting you and giving our will over to you completely. So, Lord, we open up ourselves tonight and we ask you to speak deep, deep within our heart. That you want us to hear, what you want us to know, both collectively and individually. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A number of years ago, I rode on a motorcycle from Iowa down to Bradenton, Florida. And I was only at that time about 22 years old. And I was working in radio in Iowa, and I had at that point already left the Catholic Church. I had left, I had grown up Catholic, but I left at about 21. And at 22, I'm driving down the range in Florida for a, a summer pastoral training institute. And when I was down there, there was a class that we took, and it was it was a class on what they call open air preaching. And I was fascinated because the guy who was teaching the class was, was uh, advocating that we as students would one day be able to stand up in public and proclaim the gospel. Now that's scary right there. And at the end of the class, he said that tomorrow we're going to come to the beach. Who would like to learn how to do this? And I'm like, hmm. Well, I have a problem with passing out when I talk, so maybe, I, maybe that's not for me, but I really wanted to do it, so I, I put my hand up, and about 10, 15 other people put their hand up. And so the next morning, we got a little bus, we went down to the beach, and we stood there, and there's all these people on the beach. And the teacher said, now, who wants to learn first? And nobody raised their hand, because we thought he was going to demo this. And we learned in class what to do and everything, you know, as far as the gospel publicly. I mean, we're talking radical here. And so I raised my hand. I thought, I want to do it. I, I, I want to do it. And he said, okay, come on over here, Jeff. And he said, there's the picnic bench that you can stand up on. There's your audience at the beach there. you got a story about you. And I said, yeah. He said, go to it. But I went, oh, no. <laughs> and I went over there on that picnic bench and I just kind of took a deep breath and I said, Lord, you got to help me. And I stood up and I said, Good afternoon, Florida. And everybody looked over. And I said, I want you to know that I know that this is not cool. <laughs> but I have something I want to share with you. And people started coming around. And I was only going to take five minutes in a natural way, not a goofy way, but a natural way to tell them where I come from, where I'm at, what Jesus Christ has done in my life. By the time that I was done in that five minutes, I had close to 250 people surround me, listening. And you can hear people saying things like, he's not nuts. <laughs> he's not crazy. He's normal. He's just a guy. I was trying to know these lights. And, but I said, at the end, that's all I want to share with you. I just want to share with you that Jesus Christ changed my life. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that as well. Now that was pretty radical in my life when I did that. And I did a lot of stuff like that when I was younger. But that's not where most people are at in sharing Christ, is it? It isn't where most people are at. Where most people are at is they're in a coffee shop. Or they're with relatives. Or they're at work. Or they're standing in a line at Walmart. And they overhear lots of different things throughout the day about suffering. About losing a husband. About losing a job. Uh, about about reading a book or sitting on an airplane and someone next to you reading a self-help book. 
When you really think about it, and you open up your eyes as an activated disciple of Jesus Christ, and you open up your ears, you're going to see and you're going to hear a lot of opportunities where people are searching for answers in life. And if you go to Barnes & Noble, you'll notice in the self-help section that people are desperately looking for how to get their life together. Time management, weight control, anti-depression, you know? They're looking for how to be successful in life. People are desperately searching. But there's one scripture that, that I want to read to you. And that scripture comes from, second, or comes from Colossians chapter 2. And it talks about the answers to the problems that people have. And we as Catholics believe this with all of our heart. You know, I, I do have an appreciation for Dr. Phil, an appreciation for everything you hear on TV, Dr. Adam, Rush Limbaugh, and so forth. But I also am a realist in that I know that they don't have the answer to life's problems. And even if they can suggest the answer to life's problems, they don't have the power to bring me there. They don't have the power to change my life. Just have some suggestions. And if it weren't that easy, everybody would be doing it, right? But here's what it says, Paul says to the Colossians. He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those of Laodicea, and for all who have not seen my TV face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding, and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Isn't that beautiful? I love that phrase. It says, in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I looked that up in Greek, and I wanted to know what that word meant when it said all. All wisdom and all knowledge. And I, I discovered what it meant. It meant all. <laughs> it meant all. In whom is hidden all wisdom and all knowledge. And so, as an activated disciple, as a Catholic, we make a, a choice to focus our entire life on that which has all wisdom and knowledge. And that's and I have discovered that pearl of great price. How many of you have discovered that pearl of great price? Let me see your hand. Well, lots of you have. It's amazing, isn't it? <coughs> so Jesus, as a disciple now, he's the focus of my entire life. I want to follow him, listen to him, gain wisdom, knowledge, insight. And then once I've done this, not only do I live it, but I get to share this with other people. Now when it comes to sharing Christ, with other people, I have been alarmed at the statistics in the Catholic Church. When I was in Sacramento, California, a little while ago, I was speaking there to a crowd of about 1,200, 1,300 people. And I was speaking to them and I asked the question, I said, how many of you, besides me with the Great Adventure, how many of you have ever had anybody sit down and show you how to read the Bible? Raise your hand if you've had anybody sit down and show you how to read the Bible. And I looked through that entire crowd, along with the pastor, and not one hand went up. Nobody had anybody sit down and show them how to read the Bible. And I asked the question, how many of you have ever shared Jesus Christ with someone that you didn't know, someone outside your family? And not one hand went up. And I said, this ought not to be. That this is the message that we have to share Jesus with others. And the statistics show right now that over 95% of Catholics attending church regularly will go their entire life and never share Jesus with anyone outside of their family. And that churches grow by means of people marrying into the church. For example, you can go to, uh, you can go to uh, the Easter Vigil. I went to an Easter Vigil uh, one time and when I were there, there was, I think, uh, like 3,300 families in the parish. And at the Easter Vigil, those that were coming in out of 3,300 families were three people. Three people. Two of them married 
into the church, the other one read a Scott Hahn book. <laughs> and after all the labor that year, three people were going to join this group. And I looked over them and I said, something is wrong. Something is wrong. There's certainly nothing wrong with the message. But one of the things that I know, and I know you guys got a good RCIA program here, but one of the problems that we get is, is that people don't understand how people come into the church. What do we share with people to bring them into the beauty of the Catholic Church and the fullness of faith? How do I talk to somebody and, uh, and, and how, what is the RCIA program? You know? What, 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 how, how does that work? What time of the year? What do they go for? What's the sponsor? And so one of the tasks of the parish is to educate people as to how we make spiritual babies in this church. And, and one of the things we have to learn is how do we share Christ with other, with other people. And I have found this to be one of the most dynamic things in my life, and one of the, the things that has lifted me up and encouraged me so much to see new life, to see people coming to Christ and getting it for the first time. But the problem is, is that what do we share with people? You know, what do we say to people? I mean, the Catholic Church is really, really big, isn't it? And it seems so complicated. If you've gone through the Great Adventure, you know about this, this quote, this great quote about an Englishman who talks about, he talks about how the church is so big and our kids grow up in it, and he said that, you know, there's so much, there's, there's statues, and there's an altar, and there is incense, and there's oil, and there's a, there's a priest, and there's nuns, and there's vestments, and there's sacraments, and there's bingo, and you've got, you've got the Blessed Mother, and you've got saints, and the papacy, and and you've got all of these things. How do I explain all of this to people? Well, that's what the Great Adventure Bible Study is all about, is that it's showing you the story, the great story God has for us. But what's really interesting when you read the New Testament and you see the growth of the church and what the disciples were sharing with other people is that they were not sharing all of these other things because these are things of the family. Right? If you look into the back of the church, you see on the wall, the wall of saints. That's brothers and sisters in the family. Right? You don't have to know about all of them or know about their lives, but they're sisters and brothers in the family. Uh, we look around and we see the stations of the cross. Beautiful. We understand that, but we don't have to go around telling everybody about that necessarily. The Blessed Virgin Mary or the papacy or whatever it might be. These are parts of our family. But it's not the central message of what we're responsible for sharing with people, right? And that, 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 that message, that central message that we share is hidden in the New Testament and it is repeated six or seven times in different forms in the New Testament. And when the early church went out and they proclaimed Christ to other people, there was a form or a structure to how they shared that message. And I want to share that with you tonight, that message, right? Now, when I share this message with you, there are seven steps in this proclamation. And the proclamation is called the charisma. Fancy, fancy word, charisma. And charisma means proclamation, the proclamation of the gospel. Now, you might not remember the word charisma, but how many of you have a charisma? Coffee machine. <laughs> At work or home, I'm going to have a third coffee machine. Four of them. Fantastic. The rest of you are in your system still? No, you're going to Starbucks. I, I had that there. Nitro. I've never seen that before. Woo. Anyway, you have, you see, now the curry is a cure machine. Well, just think of this. We need to start giving people a cup of curry ma. Charisma. The charisma is the proclamation, is the gospel. Let's we'll start giving people a cup of charisma. You're going to remember this corny. You're going to remember it for years to come. Every time you see a curing machine, I want you to think about pro proclaiming Christ. Every time you see a curing machine, I want you to think about proclaiming Christ and giving people a cup of charisma. Ma. Just say that once. Sure. Ah, you got it. You're a theologian. <laughs> and you're going to proclaim the charisma to people. Now, what I'd like to do tonight is I want to walk you through.
through the charisma and how we share Christ with people with some examples in my life. And I'm sure that many of you have examples as well that you can share. But before I share those seven points, I want to I want to do something. I want to, I want to predict what you're going to say in your mind after I share these seven points. Because I know when I share these seven points, what you're going to think inside of your brain is you're going to think there is no way in purgatory that I'm going to hear that. <laughs> right? Because I, I'm not doing that. I'll do, I'll do a lot of things. I'll be at night. <laughs> I'll teach CCD. I'll be on the building committee. I'll be on the finance committee. And all these things. But I will never do that. And I got news for you. Yes, you will. You can do it. You can do it. Because you see, everything that we do here in this ark called the church is for the purpose of worshiping God and spreading His kingdom. We have an obligation to do this. In fact, Pope John Paul II said, I brought this here, I want to read it to you. Uh, I took this from my book, the new book, Activated Disciples. It's over there. Listen to what he said about this. This is so powerful. He said, The vital core of the new evangelization must be a clear and unequivocal proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? He says the core, the vital core of the new evangelization, which we're all called to the new evangelization. The original evangelization was 2,000 years ago. This is the new evangelization, and the new evangelization is threefold. It is to evangelize those who have never been baptized, never known Christ. Number two, it is to evangelize those who have been baptized who need to be renewed in their faith. And the third is to evangelize and encourage leadership that's in the church today. And he says the vital core of the new evangelization must be a clear and unequivocal proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ, that is, the preaching of his name, his teaching, his life, his promises, and the kingdom which he has gained for us by his past ministry. The lay faithful, too, precisely as members of the church, have the vocation and mission of proclaiming the gospel. That's every one of us. They are prepared for this work by the sacraments of Christian initiation and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They have been in their own way made sharers in this priestly, prophetic, and kingly functions of Christ. Consequently, the lay faithful, in virtue of their participation in the prophetic mission of Christ, are fully part of this work of the church. And so should feel called and encouraged to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And so the church teaches us that to prepare to proclaim Christ to other people, you are already equipped. You're equipped. And I'm going to share some things tonight so we can equip you more. You're equipped. How are you equipped? Well, number one, you're baptized. And if you're baptized, that means that you have identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The fruits of baptism are the forgiveness of original sin. Your spirit is infused with three theological virtues. They were put in there in baptism. You can grow them or ignore them. But those three virtues are faith, hope, and charity. You've got those inside of you. Faith, hope, and charity. And the second thing that John Paul is talking about, John Paul the Great, is the power to do this, the power of the Holy Spirit, which comes to confirmation. <coughs> you know, the confirmation, in some circles, is simply a rite of passage to adulthood in the church. But the sacrament is an encounter with Christ that is not just a passage, but it is an empowering. An empowering to do what? To proclaim Christ. That's what, they, that's what it is. It's the power to proclaim. And so everybody that's been confirmed in here has received a second work of the Holy Spirit that confirms and, and, and fulfills what baptism started. And so now I have the power in my life to proclaim the gospel. Now again, you're going to be thinking, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. And you know what one of the biggest, I don't want to ruin a quote for you, but I have to. 
One of the biggest excuses that people give for not talking about Jesus to other people, you know what it is? It's a quote that they say, well, St. Francis said, which by the way, he didn't. <laughs> Never did. Proclaim the gospel in the necessary use words. And it's used as an excuse over and over. It's like, well, I proclaim the gospel just by the way I live. Yay, that's good. But we're all called to proclaim the gospel, and we've all been given a mouth, and we've all been given the gifts of baptism and confirmation, and we can share it in the most simple of ways, like Mother Teresa. And many of the saints who were not great doctors in the church, but they proclaim Christ with their sweet words of encouragement to other people. And so as I talk about this cup of curing mud tonight, it's going to be manifest on this side and this side in so many different ways that are not right or wrong. I proclaim Christ a certain way at coffee shops. I have a tattoo ministry. Did I ever tell you about my tattoo ministry? On my podcast on iTunes, you can, it's free. You can listen to every week talk about evangelization and discipleship. I talk about a whole show called my tattoo ministry. And the tattoo ministry is, I look for tattoos. I don't have any tattoos. So you're wondering right now, oh, I don't have any tattoos. Do I? My wife over here. Seen her. But everybody else that I walk around, they have these tattoos on their arms. And, and when I see a tattoo on the arm, do you know what's interesting about that? Is that typically people put on their arms, on the surface of their body, what was at one time at least deep within their heart. And what was in their heart, they put on their body. If they put it on their body, they wanted it to be seen. And when I see it, I ask questions. And so I'll see someone with two dates on here. I'll see July 7th, 1995. July 13th, 1995. I'm like, oh. And I'll just walk up and I'll start a conversation. Excuse me, I couldn't help but notice your tattoo. And they'll say, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, I got that. I said, I'm just curious, what do the dates mean? You see, there's nothing wrong with asking them. What do the dates mean? And immediately they'll start to tell me. In my tattoo ministry, I have never had anyone say, that's my business. But in every situation, they were eager to tell me that was the date that my baby was born and my baby died. His name was David. Really? Tell me about David. And I'm in a conversation with someone. Getting into a conversation with people is half the battle. And it's curiosity and asking questions and loving people and being interested in people. When I was growing up, I used to ask my dad if he would drop me off at the mall. Now, when I was a little kid in the 60s, I mean, the 90s, <laughs> I would say to my dad, will you drop me off at the mall? Now, at that time, you all didn't know what a mall was because the first mall in America was in Edina, a suburb of the Twin Cities called Southdale. It was the only mall in the middle of a park, in the middle of a cornfield. And my dad would take me over there and I would sit in the middle of the mall. You know what I would do? I'd people watch. How many of you like people watch? Why are you going to go to the Mardi Gras? We can call food, yeah. But people watch. People are interested in people. And we're interested in people. Why? Because we serve a God who's interested in people. We're fascinated with people, and God is fascinated with his, his sons and, and his daughters. Have you ever noticed how that has become less important in recent times? People? If you go back to the 1960s and look at a magazine rack, you'll see Life Magazine. Life. Biological. Plants. You know, people. Animals. Life. And then in the 70s, the big magazine was People. People Magazine went from life to people. And then, in the 80s, it went down to us. This is you and me. It's us. This is what we're going to read about. This is what's important. And then in the 90s, self. The magazine called self. And then in the zeros, it wasn't even self, just one person. Oprah. <laughs> Especially as activated disciples of the Lord. And 
And so, let's get back to our seven points. And that I know what you're going to think when you say it. So let's go through those seven points real quick. I'm going to go through them quick, and then let's go back and just explain each one just a little bit. And then I want to give you uh, some examples of sharing Christ in a natural way. Because deep down inside, I think we want to do this. Okay, number one. And these are in the book of Acts. These are speeches that have been given to follow the basic structure of proclaiming Christ. Now remember, you don't have to talk about pre-scandal. You don't have to have all the scriptures memorized about Mary. You don't have to have all the scriptures about purgatory and an explanation. You don't need to be afraid about any of that. Just tell people, I don't know all those by heart. That's interesting. I can get those though. But we do want to know the message. What is the message? And here it is, the seven points. Number one. Number one, God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. That's number one. It's very beautiful, isn't it? It's very simple. It's very warm. God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. Now, right away, our, our minds, our modern minds are thinking, I am not going to tell someone that God loves them. My, my, my response to that would be, why? Why would we say that? Is it the truth? Yes, it is the truth. Do they need to know the truth? Yes, they need to know the truth. Do you have the truth? Yes, I do have the truth. Do you have the tongue? Yes, I do. Then do it. Not my gift. Not my gift. Number one, God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. Number two, Sin has broke this relationship. It has messed our lives. Sin has messed our lives. Right? Right away, you're thinking, wait a minute, not everybody believes in sin. That's okay. That's all right. You see, this is the message. I don't have to anticipate, you don't believe this, they think I'm weird. You know? <laughs> It's the message. Number one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Number two, sin has interrupted this plan. It is serious to interrupt the plan. Number three, good news, Jesus Christ has died for our sins and given us life. That's the message right there. Number three, Jesus has died for our sins and he's given us life. Number four is that he asks us to respond to this message by repenting. Or I don't use the word repent with anything. You know what I use? I use what the Catechism says. The Catechism says that repentance is a radical reorienting of our lives. Repentance is, is a radical reorientation of our lives to Christ. That's what repentance is. Repentance is, I'm all screwed up, my life is messed up, I'm, I'm a psychological mess, my marriage is a mess, my job is a mess, my kids are a mess. I need to radically reorient my life to and when someone's really hurting, that's good news. That's good news. Not everybody's going to buy it. Fine. That's all right. So number one, God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. Number two, sin has interrupted this plan and broken our lives. And number three, God has a solution. Jesus loves us so much. He died for our sins. Number four, we need to reorient our lives to Him. And number five, we need to be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's the fifth part. Number six is that we need to join His bride, the church, the source of sacraments and grace and healing and community and purpose. Number seven, this is the seventh one, now you go and proclaim the gospel. Now you go and proclaim the gospel. Now you go and make disciples. So that's the seven points right there. And so tell me, am I, am I right? In your mind, you're thinking, ah, I'm doing that at Starbucks. And I'm going to go through those seven points with Frank at Starbucks. Well, here's the good news is that we don't have to go through all seven of those points with anybody on the spot. They act as a structure that we memorize, that we know that will guide our conversations with people. 
when people are asking questions, or people are talking about uh, the, the tragedy that has struck their family, or that they're, they're split with their spouse, or whatever it might be, a domestic abuse, whatever. And that now we at least know what trail to go down and begin to talk to people about the good news of Jesus Christ. So again, let's look at those. Number one, God loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. My friends, nothing could be more true in this universe than the fact that God loves you so much. He loves you so much. That's not an ooey-gooey love, you know? It's a love that has your eternal life in mind. He loves you as a son. He loves you as a daughter. And not only does he love you, he's got an amazing family plan for you where you can really live and, 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 and experience life the way you were supposed to. It's his plan. It's the best plan for your life. And so many of the people that we meet are out there trying to develop their own plan or, or to become you know, the, best, the best version of themselves in some way by only psychology or television or pop culture. But God is the one that does that in our life. So God loves you and he has a plan for your life. When I talk to people, oftentimes I'll say to them, say, you know, you know, Susan, I've got to tell you, God loves you. He really does. He really loves you. Now, there was a time in my life where I thought that sounded weird. But the more I know Jesus, the more I walk with him, the more normal this sounds. And the more true it brings that he loves you and has planned your life. And then I go into, in conversations, you know as well as I do, that sin really has screwed our lives up. Sin screws up our marriages. It screws up our relationships at work. It can really mess up our relationship with our children. Our finances can be spent inappropriately due to sin. I can get due to sin and, and, and other things. I can, I can start to really blow my life apart. I don't have to convince people of this. They know it. They know it deep down inside. Alcoholism is responsible for I learned just uh, this, just earlier today, in fact, a 55% of all domestic violence is due to alcohol. Alcohol. It will screw you up. It will ruin your life if you can't handle it. Sin disrupts this plan. But the good news is, is that Jesus, with his plan, has died for us, and he's going to bring us new life. He's going to bring us new life. But it's not magic. He expects us to reorient our lives to him. That's called re repentance. And then submit to him in baptism and confirmation to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to live this life. So we can go on and on and on about those, about those seven points, but, but still we might not be convinced that we could do that even in a, in a casual conversation with someone. But here's the kicker. Here's the reason it works. Because I know, I know you, I've been there, <laughs> I was a pastor for 12 years. I know how people think about this and that I would never do it. That would scare me. I would be afraid to do that. Exactly. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Be courageous. Be loving. Be the disciple you were created to be. Without Christ, we could never do this. But with Christ, all things are possible. And we are now doing things that we could never do before. Like Peter. Peter was crucified upside down for his faith. Twelve men, minus Judas, changed the world and turned Asia minor upside down. It's modern day Turkey, and then Greece, Europe. Amazing. But here's the reason that I want to give to you this is the game changer. The message of the seven points, the cup of pure Ma. That's the seven points. The game changer is this. Three times in the New Testament it says that the Holy Spirit confirmed the message. You get that? The Holy Spirit confirmed the message. Now there's a lot of things we do in the church which are positive, fruitful, constructive, and need. You know, as far as we need this in the church, all the way from, from uh, fundraisers to uh, summer uh, picnics, the fall bash, all kinds of programs in the church 
but there's one thing the Holy Spirit confirms. You know what confirms? The Holy Spirit makes it known and a sure thing. And that is the message. The message. So the good news that I have for you tonight, and the freeing thing that I have for you tonight, is that when you share Christ with people, it's not about you. It's about the message. And the Holy Spirit takes that wherever it's proclaimed and says, In other words, if you share Christ with me and I'm looking at you with my hands folded like this, and I go, uh-huh, uh-huh, and you start talking to me, and I got my guard up, the Holy Spirit will take what you're saying and confirm it in my heart. That's the word of the Holy Spirit. That's what sets me free to be able to share with anybody, and I'm not too worried about it if I, if I do it in a loving way that isn't silly, goofy, but is truly transparent with people. You see what I'm saying? So I can take that to seven points, and I can make it part of my conversation with absolutely anybody who is hurting in life. Now, there was a man, there was a man in our culture that took the charisma, which is Catholic, and is our message. And he, for 70 years, did nothing but proclaim the charisma. He did nothing but proclaim the gospel, the proclamation of the good news. He died this last year. And all of you know who he is, and all of you have heard him at one time or another. And he stood up in front of an old wooden pulpit like that. And he did nothing Protestant, nothing Catholic. He did the current one, which is Catholic. And it is Protestant. Right? And it's the basic message. And maybe you remember him speaking as he stood up and said, God has a plan for your life. And God loves you, my friend. God loves you. But sin has interrupted this plan. It has destroyed families. It has destroyed individuals. It has destroyed the country and the very fabric of our culture. But I've got good news for you. And that is that Jesus Christ has come to die for our sins. And he loves you. And I'm going to ask you to repent tonight. I'm going to ask you to turn from what that is killing you in your life. And I'm going to ask you to turn to Jesus Christ and to give your life. Today is an hour of decision. Today God is calling you to come to Him for new life. And you know you need that new life. And I'm going to ask you to be baptized into Jesus Christ and receive the power of the Holy Spirit to live the life that God has called you to. And after we're done, I'm going to have you come forth. And I'm going to have you pray. And we're going to give you a rosary to sky. How many of you have heard what I'm talking about? Yeah. Who is it? Yeah. It's Billy Graham who won two million people to Jesus Christ. With what? A Protestant message? No. A Catholic message? No. The message. The message. That's the message. And what did the Holy Spirit do? He could stand, he could stand there and Orange County, California, where the angels play, and 55,000 people gathered, doctors, lawyers, engineers, housewives, house husbands, everything else, homeless, and come together and give only what I've given you tonight. But he did it with a little bit of flair, didn't he? God loves you, and God has a plan for you. Now, as he's saying, God has a plan for your life. What's happening? The Holy Spirit is confirming the message. The Holy Spirit is confirming the message. And that's what we fail to understand. Is that we think it's all up to us. It's up to my ingenuity, my, my ability to argue and rhetoric and memorization. Mm -mm. All it is is me telling you the truth. You broken person. 
You need person. You person whose life is falling apart. I want to share something with you. I don't have to be embarrassed. I don't have to be ashamed. I want to say something. I want to say something with all the force that I can think of. And I mean it with all my heart. Brothers and sisters, fellow activated disciples of Jesus Christ, listen. We don't have another message. We don't have another message. We don't. We don't even have a sneaky way to get this across. It's the message. And we're the ones with it. And we're the ones interacting in society. And we're the ones hearing the problem. And we're the ones who can lovingly share with people. Do you know I've been sharing Christ with people for over 40 years now? And do you know that I have never, ever had anybody attack me or think that I was crazy or, or tell me to get lost? I've never had that. But I have had lots of, it, of people saying, thank you, thank you. Because most of the people that I talk to, I don't tell them all seven points. You know, I don't say, hey, hey I'm in the Starbucks. I overheard that your, uh, uh, your wife left you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, let me just say, um, <laughs> God loves you. <laughs> and has a, a pleasant, amazing plan for your life. I mean, life. And <laughs> sin has really screwed your life up. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being equipped to carry on a conversation to get to a solution for people in their life. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's a true story. I went into a coffee shop and I saw something I had some lady I hadn't seen on call her Helen. I haven't seen her for quite a while. And I looked at her and the grandma said, hey, how was your job? I said, how are you doing? I haven't seen you for so long. See, this message is for the, the, those who have not been baptized, but it's for those who have been baptized too. It might even be straight, right? Or their lives are falling apart. I said, wow, it's, it's good to see you. How are you doing? But, you know, and she said, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I, how are you doing? And, and she said, well, it's not, things haven't been going so good. Uh, uh, Harry and I have split. Really? Now I got a choice there. She just told me that her life is falling apart. She's got three kids. She and her and her husband are separate right now. Now I can do the typical social thing and this. I'm so sorry to hear that. How's everything else going? <laughs> what is that? You know, is the lawn being cut? Uh, you repaint the side of your house. What do you mean? What else is going on? This is pretty big. And they get this. She told me. We've got to wake up to what people are saying. She told me this. She's opened the door. My husband and I have split. And I knew them as a good couple. They loved each other. Things were going great. Well, what happens? He asked questions. Asked questions. What happened? People say, well, that's none of my business. No, it might not be your business, but it's his business. And he said he wanted his business. What happened? What happened? I'm curious. Well, the Lord just kind of grew apart. You've heard that before, right? It just kind of grew apart. And, you know, so my way, it's going his. And, you know, it's just things got just, you know, it was, it, it, we just realized we weren't compatible and, and, and so forth. All of this is not true, okay? But I don't have to argue about this. I'm going to give her the message in love. And see what the Holy Spirit can confirm here. And so I, I said to her, I'm really concerned to hear that. I said, Helen, can I, can I just say something to you? I just feel like I need to share with you. That is honest. That's not a weirdo. That's a friend. That's a friend, you know? Can I just share something with you? I said, sure. Can we sit down for a second? Sit down. You know, Helen, I gotta tell you, God loves you and Harry so much. He really does. He loves you guys so much. And I know that he has an amazing plan for your life. Both of you. And I think you knew that at one point, right? She shook her head. And I, I, I think that that's really true. But you know what, Helen? You know as well as I do that when we're in sin in our life, something happens in our life, and we're not walking the way the Lord wants us to anymore, that our lives can get really, really goofed up. 
It really can. She's like, tell me. And I said, I just want you to know that if the two of you together, I'll work with you if I can, if you can reorient your life to Jesus Christ, he can make something out of this. I know it. And she stops me and says, she says, oh. she says, I, I, I have screwed up. I screwed up royally. I said, what happened? She says, question. Well, this is life and death. This is a family. And I got the message. She said, well, about four years ago, I had surgery on my shoulder. And after surgery, the doctor gave me a Percocet when I went home. And I took it. And I went back and I got another prescription after that. And then after that, I went back and the doctor said, I can't give you any more. And he gave me just a few and, and I, I was addicted. And I went doctor shopping after that. And that became the center of my life. And everyone said I changed. Kids said I changed, my husband changed. I, did, I, did. I was fooling myself. And then I started stealing from my sisters, and my brothers. And, my life just started falling apart, and that's, we just didn't make it through it. And I, 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 I'm not on it anymore, but, so she's telling me how sin screwed up our life. And I was able to pray with her. Now, nothing that I said was scripture verses or theology or anything like that. It was just a guy talking about the basic proclamation of Christ. And the Holy Spirit confirmed it in her life. You know what I'm saying? The Holy Spirit confirmed it. And so when we share this basic message with people in love, and, and someone's broken and they're, they're even crying, saying, my, my life is really moved up right now, and we're sitting there with this, we owe it to them, it's justice, we owe them this, that I can say that as simple as, let me, can I talk to you for a second? God loves you so much. Now when a broken heart hears uh, a true disciple of the Lord looking him in the eyes and saying, God loves you so much, Susan. Daryl, God loves you so much. I'm telling you, he loves you. I don't have to worry about what people are thinking about me. It is about me. I'm the messenger. I'm the envoy. I'm the ambassador. I'm giving you the good news. And the Holy Spirit confirms it. I have seen time after time after time where I will share with people and God will come through in amazing ways. And I'm convinced with all of my heart that the, the key to the church growing in these times is people who are Catholic becoming activated disciples and beginning to share with others. I thought it would be the simplest thing possible. I'm going to give you a couple of situations where, um, where this, this came up in my life and I was able to share with people. I was standing one time in a restaurant in Philadelphia. I was shooting a new Bible study called Galatians. And I shot it in two days with an audience in the church. Four lessons on one day and four on the next. There were one hour lessons, four on one day, four on the next, right? With an introduction. At the end of the first day, my chaperone picked me up at the hotel and we were going to breakfast. We are going to breakfast. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of things here that anybody can do in their life. It's actually very simple to start sharing uh, with the Lord, sharing the Lord with the people. I'm at the restaurant, I'm standing up there, and I am looking at the menu up above. Eggs, bacon, coffee, so forth. And I said to my friend, I'll take that scrambled eggs and bacon and coffee, which is whipped cream. So I said, okay, so I'm there, and as I'm standing there, and this is all that happens, so I'm standing there, Five guys come walking this way, okay? And one of them, the lead guy, has a great big, he has a, he has a great big honkin' Bible. Now, honkin' is Greek for large. <laughs> he's walking, he's just a great big guy, just so happy, you know? And there's four of them behind him. So I'm standing there in line, looking at my eggs and bacon about ready to be served to me, like this. And he comes walking this way. Now here's what I did. Now I'm going to demonstrate it, but I'm going to ask you not to copy this because I, I'm educated in this. <laughs> this comes from graduate school. Okay? So I'm standing there, and he's walking this way, and I'm a disciple. I'm an activated 
disciple. I love to share Christ with people. And I, I went like this. Now, I'm going to do it one time quick, in real time, and I'm going to do it in slow motion. Okay? So I'm standing there. I see him come with a very big smile on his face. And here's what I did. Looks like you guys are studying the Bible. <laughs> Don't try that. <laughs> this is dangerous stuff. So now I'm going to do it in slow motion one time. Because uh, if you got a video, you might want to <laughs> have your father do this later and make it available on the right side or something. So I did this. Look, Bible, big smile. <laughs> Looks like you guys are studying the Bible. Does that mean? Now he's walking this way. He's all happy, and all of a sudden he sees me. Looks like you guys are studying the Bible. He says, Oh, yeah, praise God. You know, we're still studying the Bible all the time. I'm telling myself, Do you study the Bible? And I said to him, Yeah, I love to study the Bible too. He goes, Oh, praise God. Well, Lord God, have a good day, brother. And I said, Yeah, have a good day, brother. And he walks out. I take my eggs, I walk over. And this is what I was talking about last night, is knowing the voice of the Lord. The Lord's not crazy. <laughs> the Lord is gentle. And the Lord uses us in amazing ways. This is a real relationship. This is a make-believe religion. This is a real relationship. A real God speaks to real sons and real daughters and has them on a mission. I feel sorry for people who are not on that mission. It's just so fun. So I'm, I'm ready to put the eggs down. I looked over, and the last guy, the guy with the, the Bible, is filling up his mug to go. The other one's already gone. And as I put it down, I, all I thought in my mind was, go talk to him. That's it. Go talk to him. So I, I, I go talk to him. Now, at that point, I got a decision. <laughs> Am I crazy? <laughs> Did I have pizza last night? Did I not get enough sleep? Was it just my thought? We always say, well, it's just my thought. Well, how are you going to know? <laughs> so I did that and I said to my buddy, I said, excuse me, I, I think the Lord wants me to talk to that guy over there. He goes, oh, oh, okay. Well, uh, why don't you just talk to him? Go ahead, I'll watch your eggs. <laughs> and I said, okay. So I turn around, I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. None. I started walking over, no idea. No idea. Walk over there, he catches my eyes, I catch his eyes. He goes, hey. And uh, I said, tell me, what, what, how did you get so excited about studying the Bible? Now I know what he's thinking. He's from a, he's from a non denominational church. He's got a hobby Bible and a smile on his face. And I know he's a soul winner, and here comes this lost little Catholic over there. <laughs> Well, first of all, yeah, you know, I said, sure. He says, well, first of all, I was raised Catholic, and I, and I, I ended up getting saved, so I had to leave, so I wasn't going to be fed. And I said, you had to leave the Catholic Church. Well, I'm dying to try So, he said, yeah, I had to leave the Catholic Church, but I wasn't being, I wasn't being fed. I said, huh. And I said, well, how did you get so excited then about, about the Lord? And, and, and I just wanted to get to know him a little bit, and I'll see what happens here. He said, well, I was going to college. And when I was in college, uh, uh, my wife and I were sitting upstairs, and, and, and I was really discouraged. Uh, my life was falling apart. Other oh, things weren't going well. And anyway, this priest, this Catholic priest, comes up to our, our floor, and he, he comes into our room, and he's talking to a bunch of us, and, and he's talking about Jesus, and God has a plan for my life, and, and it was just really, really cool, and the Holy Spirit, and he prayed with us, and, you know, just, wow, something happened, and I went, I, I want to give my life to God. And of course, I was Catholic, so I had to leave. And, um, and I was going to go to chapel, you know, in Philadelphia. And I'm like, really? Really? I said, uh, what school was that that you went to? He said, oh, you wouldn't know. He said, well, a while ago, a while ago, it was a, a, a Catholic school in Ohio called Franciscan University. <laughs> That 
this school? He said, uh, uh, Father Michael Scan. Wow. <laughs> He said, have you ever heard of this school? I said, uh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I taught there. He said, you taught at Franciscan University. I said, thanks. What do you teach? I said, scripture. He said, okay, we need to talk. I said, are you Catholic? And he said, I am. And I introduced him to the great adventure by his son. And it all started with an incredible entry. <laughs> that was that was it. I've done this before, but I never thought of it. I've never done anything. Sometimes I just in front of the mirror at home. That are that are absolutely amazing. You know that you don't even have to have words sometimes to share the Lord with people. In the course of a regular conversation, it's a good idea to know that God loves you and has a plan for your life. Sometimes that's as far as I get. You have a good day too. And then you know what? Scripture says one man waters, another man fertilizes it, and God causes the increase. Sometimes I'm not all seven. Sometimes I'm just, you know what? I want you to know, God loves you. God loves you. Plant a seed. Holy Spirit, confirm. Confirm. The rest of the day, can't get that out of my mind. God loves me. One time I was on my way to a Mayo Clinic from Minneapolis. I was going down to Rochester in Minnesota, as is the case. Um, there was a snowstorm. And it was sleet and snow coming down, and the roads were getting icy on 52. And I was going down to Rochester, driving there for a checkup. My doctor was at the Mayo Clinic. And I'm driving there, and all of a sudden, on the right hand side of the road, there's a car pulled over. There's a car pulled over, and the hood is up. And as I pulled up next to it, there's a lady about 20 some years old, and she's looking under the hood. Now, I walked and thought that if that happened to Emily or one of my three daughters, I want some nice guy to pull over and help them. So I just drove on. <laughs> You 
know? And she says, what? I said, I I'm going to pray for your car. I said, I, I can't do anything else. I can take you to a station. Why don't we do this? You go in your car, and I will pray for your car, and then I'll tell you when to start it. And she said, are you serious? I am serious. Just, just do it. She said, so she goes in there, I'm under the hood, and I say, all right, Lord, <laughs> you're going to have to do something here. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> but the Lord, I just show her you love her. Show her you love her. Or heal me after I make a fool of myself. Because <laughs> I'm willing to say, well, you know, I'll take you to the station now. That didn't work. So I said, Lord, I put my hand on the engine. I said, Lord, help this lady. Please help this lady. I said, all right. <laughs> he turned the key. Boom! Started right up. And it's like, ah! opportunities we have. And I, and I love it. And, and let me just end with, with uh, this last little, little deal. I was at one gas station in Pelotero. And two things happened within a week. At the, the morning, I was on radio. I was on radio. I was a radio announcer. I was also moving into becoming an associate pastor in a denomination in Iowa. And, and, I, and well, a lot of this stuff is all done as a head. And some of this stuff is done as a little bit younger. And I'm at the gas station and I'm standing inside. And I notice this guy comes up to get gas. Because that's what you do at a gas station. He's up there getting gas. And, and as I'm looking out at him, I have a thought. Now, I don't expect to do all this instead of this week. And then wait till next week. <laughs> He says, I, I get a thought. Tell him that I love him. Yeah. Oh. That is pizza. I said, tell him that I love him. And I'm really strong. Tell him that I love him. I couldn't shake it. I couldn't shake it. And he comes walking into the store. And he comes up to the counter there. And I'm standing at the counter. And I looked at him and said, sir, I said, can I say, say something to you? He said, the shirt. And so it's 6.30 in the morning. And I said, uh, I just thought I had to tell you something. He said, what? God really loves you. He really does. And he backed off. He got this look on his face. I went, uh-oh. Uh. <laughs> and he slammed his hand on the counter. And he goes, what is going on today? He said, it's 6.30 in the morning. And you're the third person who has told me that. <laughs> me, he loved him. <laughs> and he ended up talking to him, and it turns out he was running from something. He was hurting. He needed to know that God really loved him. This is an example of just this little thought. Another man came in a week later at the gas station. He was on a motorcycle. He was driving on a motorcycle. What was his name on Dean. He came in on a motorcycle and he's standing, he comes into the gas station and uh, I said, where are you going to? Where are you traveling on a motorcycle? He said, I don't really know. He said, I'm just driving. I'm just driving. And I said, uh, I said it sounds like you're, you're running from something or leaving something. He says, I am. He said, I'm just driving. I'm driving east from California. He said, uh, uh, my wife and I split up. And I'm just trying to figure things out. And I'm on a ride across, across the country. And I said, really? I said, what's your name? He said, Dean. I said, Dean, can I, can I talk to you for a second? He said, sure. And I said to him basically that message. I said, God really loves you. 
And God has a plan for your life. And, 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 and God wants you to be restored and healed. He said, yeah, I suppose, I know. And I said, let me ask you a question. What are you doing today? He said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll probably go to Des Moines. And I said, would you like to have dinner with me? Now, people aren't used to that. Would you like to have dinner? He said, yeah, that's very nice. And I called her and I said, do you have dinner? And she said, no. Yes. Jumps up to something again. <laughs> and uh, I, I took him and went over to the house and we talked to him at dinner about chases and about marriage and about God's will for his life. He got choked up and he started to cry. And he said, Can I use you for him? And I said, Sure. And I prayed for him first. And he got on the phone and he called his wife from California. And he said, Baby, he said, I'm coming home. He said, I'm coming. I've given my life to God. I know that I can't keep running like this. I'm coming home. And he ended up going home. And later, in another vacation, he and his wife came back to town and visited with us. In town. You see, the good news is just the good news. And it's something that we need to learn to share with, with people. So what I'm going to do in conclusion is I, is I want to just remind you that everything I shared with you tonight about the cup of fruit mom the basic proclamation. Uh, don't be overwhelmed by this. Don't think, oh, there's no way I'm going to do all that. I couldn't. Start small. Just start telling people, you know, hey, God bless you. I'll pray for you. Just get used to sharing with people. And you'll be surprised at how many people will keep the conversation going. And just remember, there's nothing wrong with saying that God loves you. God has a plan for your life. And, uh, and, and to see what the Holy Spirit does. I find it to be a tremendous adventure. But grow into it, as well as what we were talking about last night. The shape of your day. Start listening to his word in the morning. Listening to scripture. Taking it in. And seeing how God ministers to you throughout the day. Or how you can share that with somebody else. Those, that are, those parishes that are vibrant in America now, they have several things in common. Adoration, Eucharistic adoration. They support vocations, big time. And the people are learning to share the gospel. I just got done. I went to Minneapolis four days ago. I went up there for one day, one day only. And the reason was is that in this last fall, I taught all eight chapters of my activated disciple uh, It's that's over there in the uh, cafe. And, uh, and then after that, people go on a 40 day challenge. They sign up at ascensionpress.com. They get a journal. They go through a 40 day challenge. Act like a disciple every day, like Sio Kavina, listening to the Lord, and looking for opportunities to share Christ. And then we all came together for a reunion to share stories. Amazing. Women standing up saying, I've never shared Christ with anybody before, but I have been sharing the Lord uh, three, four times a week with people, just a little bit here, a little bit there, and they're saying, you know what? This <laughs> is addictive. I like sharing Jesus with people, and people are so receptive. And we're getting emails from people telling us that the first time in my life I've ever told anybody about Jesus and what he means to me. Now, at the beginning of the charisma, as you'll see in the book, the beginning of the charisma, before a message is given, there's usually a miracle or a happening of wonder. And from that point, there's an explanation about Jesus. And there was a, a wonderful author who brought this up one time. He said, he said, does that mean that every time you share Christ with someone, it has to be a miracle? And his answer was, yes. And the miracle is your soul and what God has done in your life. You see, nobody can take that away from you. If Jesus has given you peace, if Jesus has given you direction in your life, nobody can take it away. And that's my story. I can say, let me, let me tell you about my story. When I found out that God loved me so much, and he had a plan for my life. And this is what I was doing in my life. But I, I turned away from that. I turned to the Lord. And He has really done uh, uh, quite a thing in my life. And uh, I've never heard back. That's your story. Learn how to tell your story to people who are looking for a story. And don't worry about how silly or base or simple it sounds. They don't need complexity at that point in their life. They need hope. They need hope. And you represent that now tomorrow night, we're going to talk about how to deal with suffering in our life. And I'm not going to be deep 
be theological about it and talk about the theology of suffering at a lay level so we all understand the value of suffering and what we do in the midst of our suffering. And I'm going to show you in the simplest of ways how you offer up your suffering in union with Christ and what is the fruit of that. What happens biblically? What happens when you do that? My friend, if you are suffering physically or in the heart in some way, morally, called moral suffering, John Paul the Great did, and that's the heart, oh, that's that heartache, heartache. And he said, most people would rather have a broken leg than a broken heart any day. He said, what do you do with it? Do you have a place to go with that suffering? We're going to talk about suffering in the life of a disciple and how valuable it is. And I'm going to share with you my story of when my mind broke. And I went through nine months of A. And what the Lord showed me in the middle of it. And how my good friend Scott Hahn ministered to me on the phone nightly to study and read scripture. And what was the outcome of that? Because I know that a lot of you are suffering. You know, I, I just been talking to you afterwards. You, you lost children. You lost grandchildren. You lost your husband. There has been sickness in the family. There has been financial and vocational ruin in some people's lives. And God wants to be a part of this. And He repeats everything. So tomorrow night we're going to conclude with the tough part of being a disciple, which is what do we do? What do we do with her, you know, in, in our life? I'm going to pray, and after I pray, I just mention a couple things real quick, and then we're going to go from there. Uh, and I'd love to meet you in Cafe Light Cross outside the door here. By the way, if you're not from this parish uh, and you're looking for a parish to belong in, a church to be a, a part of a family, this is an incredible place. It's a place that welcomes people who all look different. And when you walk out, you see a line of pictures in the back there. Uh, Father Josh is very big on the communion of saints and that people see saints that look like them. All saints are not white. All saints are not black. All saints are not brown. The saints are all of us. And we're members of the body of Christ. But what he has going over there is truly remarkable in their outreach. And if you ever get a chance to look at that, it's, it's really a tremendous work. And I'm, I'm excited about what Father Josh is doing. I pray for it. I pray that you guys can get about 25 or 30 more of the Joshes.
we thank you for this, and we ask for the intercession of our dear mother uh, to help us to be bold, more bold about your son. Hail Mary. For grace, the Lord is the couple of things. One, you didn't get your Great Adventure Bible, you're the first church in America to have these shipped out to the first one. And we have sold thousands of them on, uh, online almost immediately when they were printed. And this is a, a third shipment that has come in in Philadelphia and they're selling almost out now. We've got a bundle of them here. It's the first time any parish has had. So the Great Adventure Catholic Bible is here. It has the Great Adventure timeline and articles and charts, faith right into it. So they teach you how to read the Bible in chronological order. The second thing is, if you're dealing with suffering, and we we'll talk about this tomorrow night, a book called When You Suffer, Biblical Keys for Hope and Understanding. This is a book that I wrote, and, uh, uh, and this, this, is, this is meant for everyday people to understand the suffering in their life. It's there. If you have family members that left the church, and, you're wondering if you're ever going to come back and people ask me all the time, why did you leave? Why did you come back to the church? Uh, Scott Bond told me to write a book. <laughs> so I did. My life on the rock, a rebel who turns to the Catholic faith. And in this edition that's out there now is uh, now with uh, a special chapter called Leading Others to Christ. And in it are prayers that you can use for people to pray with that are Catholic or are not Catholic, are not baptized or have been baptized. And so Scott and I wrote that chapter, that Leading Others to Christ. What we're talking about tonight, it's in the book, My Life on the Rock. The third is my wife's book, Lily of Mohawks, the story of St. Peteria Tekawita. She's Native American, and it is an amazing story. And she researched this, and she wrote about St. Peteria. St. Peteria not a foot off the ground, but St. Peteria with both feet on the ground. She's a woman just like us. And the story of uh, her conversion is remarkable, remarkable. So Ignatius put this out, Father Papa, for me to be gentle to forward uh, to, that, uh, to that book. So those are some of the things that are available there. And I am going to turn this back over to Father Josh. And uh, looking forward, how many of you are going to Poland in September? Great. Right. Hope to see you. We're going to have a lot of good for the last Great, yo. So uh, tomorrow night at 6 30, we'll see you here. Afterwards, we'll be in the cafe signing books, selling books. These are all great resources, not only for you, but for our community. So please take them and share them so we can all become saints and our walk toward eternity. The Lord be with you. Amen. And Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeff and Emily.